This is the Unstarving Musician Podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. The podcast features conversations with me, indie music artists, and industry professionals. And it's all intended to help other indie music artists be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. Hello, musicos and fans of La Musica. Welcome to another episode. It is a pleasure, as always, to be in your ears today. This is going to be an episode about creating a business around your music and your artistic side, and it features Fabiana Claura. This is episode 233. I can't believe it. Before we get to that, if you are a, if you are a regular and have been wondering where I've been, the move to Mexico from Panama has been a little distracting, I guess I could say. I also had a couple of unfortunate health issues, including a GI thing recurring and a non-related issue with my back. The back is still recovering, but much better, and the gut biome has recovered, thank goodness. <laughs> um, the podcast wasn't the only thing that I was having trouble keeping up with. My, my exercise fell to the wayside, too, for what perhaps are obvious reasons with all the illness. It's kind of a vicious circle, though, when you're not feeling well, and then Boom, you throw your back out because you're starting to get out of flexibility shape and all those things. Anyways, we're settling into life after a few bumps in the road. Oh yeah, there was a dog attack too just two days ago as I'm recording this intro. Uh, my wife and I and dog Chico were walking in a lovely park and I noticed before I stopped to admire three ducks doing their duck thing by a pond, I noticed these two large dogs off-leash playing together and with their owner nearby. And as I'm watching the bu ducks, the next thing I know, uh, my wife is in the middle of these two dogs trying to keep them off of Chico and finally pleaded for my help. <laughs> Thank goodness, because these things happen so fast. It's like uh, you start moving in slow motion, or I do anyway. I need to work on my cat-like reflexes. But anyway, I, I ran in there and uh, could not get the dogs away. Uh, one of them in particular was pretty large. So I grabbed poor Chico, picked him up, and uh, the larger dog, meanwhile, is trying to bite at him, ends up getting me in the shoulder, and he's so tall on his hind legs, I had to get up on a park bench to keep Chico away from him. And it wasn't funny at the time, but anyway, um, Chico's fine. The owner of those dogs finally got them under control, and um, I don't know, less than a, maybe 30 seconds later, I noticed my already ailing back was super ailing. Chico's all right. He he did get a couple of little uh, superficial wounds. I wouldn't be surprised if he was a little sore. They can't really tell you those kind of things. He was limping a bit at first, but we got home. He was okay, and uh, I'm okay, and Sammy's okay. Uh, there's so many dogs in our neighborhood, and I think it's just one of those crazy things that happens when we trust our dogs a little more than we should. Anyway, all this has kept me from releasing episodes on normal schedule as of late. This episode is my last pre-recorded interview in the queue, so to speak, for the podcast. I haven't been booking new interviews for a while as I'm planning to deep dive into past episodes in the coming weeks for a new and more in-depth perspective. I feel like I've had so many valuable conversations over the 200 plus episodes just for this podcast that I've not fully mined for gold. Gold is in good stuff that, that you can use, that I can use. So that's what I'll be working on for you in the coming weeks, starting with the next episode. Something else I've been working on is rebranding the Unstarving Musician community as it pertains to the newsletter. That is the Unstarving Musician community newsletter. <laughs> I've also made some changes that will help me start delivering more of the stuff that you're really interested in. Um, the newsletter, as it is still called, is a great way to learn what I'm, what I've learned from all the conversations that I've had for the podcast and. Uh, for all the conversations I will have for the podcast so, so that we can learn together and stay current. You can sign up for the yet-to-be-renamed newsletter at unstarvingmusician.com. It's a weekly-ish email that comes with insights and musings you can use in your music journey. It's free, it's easy to unsubscribe, and it is a great way to support the Unstarving Musician. We were two weeks away from moving to Querétaro when I spoke with Fabiana for this episode. 
She now resides in the U.S., but has also lived in Bolivia and Cuba, and she has some loose ties to Panama. Her father uh, lived there for a while, so she had visited Panama City some years ago, she told me. I mentioned that because I was in Panama for about the last six years. But living abroad, she says, has given her a global perspective toward music, entrepreneurship, and education. She founded the Unstarving, excuse me, not the Unstarving anything. She founded the Musician's Profit Umbrella Business Mentorship Program for Musicians. She was also founder and director of the Music Business and Entrepreneurship Program at the University of North Texas, not far from the Arlington and Fort Worth areas in which I grew up in, in uh, the DFW Metroplex, as we call it, back there. Fabiana holds a Doctor of music, Musical Arts in Piano Performance, a degree, that is, with um, cognates? Huh. <laughs> anyway, yes, that may be a word that I have never said in this context or a word that I mistyped. From her bio. But let's just say it is a degree with cognates in music business and entertainment industries from the University of Miami. She received her master's from SMU, Southern Methodist University, also in Texas, and a bachelor's from the College of Charleston. Her credentials in education as an educator, a performing pianist, and entrepreneur run deep, much deeper than what I just mentioned. But you can learn more about her street cred at FabianaClara.com. And rather than spell that for you here, I'm going to include her website in the show notes so you can check her out. In this conversation, Fabiana and I talk about her living and growing up abroad. As I mentioned, she's lived in Cuba, has family connections in Bolivia, and some loose connections in Panama. Her education and adventures in faculty at North Texas University. We also discuss helping musicians align artistic, personal, and professional strengths into a unified sense of identity that they can turn into a business and money. That's important for us. The Musician's Profit Umbrella concept that is Fabiana's online business mentorship program is another point we hit in our conversation. We chat about creating a business while staying true to one's artistic side and more. There's always more, right? And uh, it sounds like she has a great partner in crime. And I mentioned that because I think this is important when you're on these entrepreneurial or life adventures, having a good partner in crime and a spouse or a, a partner, whatever you call your partner in crime. It sounds like she has a good one. She periodically runs an introductory master class in which you can get an idea of what she and the Musician's Profit Umbrella are all about. I encourage you to find her and find out about her master classes at, again, FabianaClara.com. All right. So here's me talking to Fabiana Clara. Yeah, are you yeah. ready? Because we're just going to... Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Are you in Denton, Texas? Yes. Yes, I am. I was doing a little research, and it finally came together that you might be there. I saw you were in San Antonio recently, yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> That's nice. I'm So I'm from Fort Worth originally. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a small world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, actually grew up admiring all of the drummers that came out of out of uh, Denton <laughs> from the yes. university. Yeah, yes. where, where you have a lot of connections there. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a small world. Where are you originally from? I was born in Chicago, and my parents are from Bolivia. And I grew up in different uh, parts of the world, in, in the U.S., as well as in Bolivia and in Cuba. Okay. Yeah, you have, I couldn't quite pin your accent and then your name. And I'm like, okay, where is she from? But you're from all over, it sounds like. I am, yes. Wow. Are, do you have family in Bolivia? Yes, I do. My dad lives there. How cool. Do you ever get back? I don't even know what it's like there right now. Is it okay to visit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. Uh, I haven't been there in a long time, though. Um, you know, my family li comes to the United States quite often. My mom lives here. My sister lives here. So... My dad comes and goes, so I haven't been there in like 20 years or so, so it's been a while. Oh, wow. Been a yes. I heard somebody here where we live said something to us about it, something about economy or government or something. But Oh, yeah, there's always all sorts of unrest, but I mean, my dad is there. He comes and goes all the time, and 
I think it's different when you're local. You you can understand the the danger. Yeah. But you're also like it's familiar. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And part of like for us, I always tell people living abroad. I figure because we, you know I meet people here who are from Panama, and they want to go to Spain or something. And I I decided we've been here six years, and I decided that part of the bliss it can be part of the bliss of living abroad is to being uh, blissfully ignorant of local politics and some of the some of the cult parts of culture that you just you don't know about unless you go out of your way to know it. And that sounds like I haven't, in a way, like I haven't gone out of my way to try to understand the culture, but there are just certain things, if you know what I mean, that um, if you're a little unaware of it, it kind of makes you, you can just deal with your own home politics or whatever. <laughs> Settle with yeah. that. Oh, totally. You know, I lived in Cuba for five years and the first two years I was completely oblivious, you know, to what was going on uh, because I was there through the lens of a foreigner, right? And so it wasn't until I started dating my husband now, who was Cuban, born and raised, you know. Okay. And okay. I started seeing things from his perspective that I was like, oh, my gosh, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, so I totally relate to what you're saying. It's when you get the bubble, you, you know, you get to enjoy a lot of the things without having to see other parts of it, too. That's right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so he's from Cuba and you spent time there. That's cool. I hope to go there someday. We haven't been. So did you get... The bulk of your education at North Texas, your music education and doctorate? Uh, no, actually, I was faculty there. I taught oh, okay. there for five years. I studied uh, in, in well in Cuba first of all, and then in Charleston, South Carolina. Then we came to Texas for SMU. We did four years at Southern Methodist University, okay. and then I did my doctorate at the University of Miami. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, that's where I got all my degrees. And, and your doctorate is it piano performance? Yes. That's a cool, uh, I saw a little bit of your playing just this morning and oh, lovely. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a promo video on your website, I believe. And I'm sure there's some others uh, if I look around enough, but it was very nice. And as I expected when I was reading about you, like you're pro probably extremely competent on your instrument. <laughs> 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 and so I know that you had, uh, you were involved as faculty at North Texas in this entrepreneurship program or, or mm -hmm. revolving around entertainment and music. When and why did you sort of get into this area where you've gone toward working with, uh, I assume, independent musicians and helping them outside of this sort of faculty world that you were at and more as a, an entrepreneur of your own? Yeah. So I, you know, I had been an entrepreneur before I became a faculty member because when I finished my doctorate degree, I started my music school. Um, my husband and I created a, a oh, music wow. academy, a brick and mortar business. So for the first five years past our doctorate degree studies, we ran our own business. We were full-time entrepreneurs and um, we really went through all the ups and downs of learning how to run a business. And within five years, I felt that I had reached a plateau where I felt that I had more to do, that I could offer more, uh, that I had learned about running a business uh, and that I could do more, right? So the opportunity to, to come to UNT just really appeared in my inbox one day where they were looking for someone who could build that business uh, mindset for musicians and help them create their careers. So I was ex super ex excited to take on that opportunity. And I applied, of course, at that point, my husband was like, but we've got a music school here in Miami. What are you going to do if we get the job? How are we going to, like, what are we going to do with our business? We can't just leave. And I remember telling him, well, let's just, you know, cross that bridge when we get there. I'm just going to apply. We'll see. I mean, we all know how you know, unlikely the statistics are for academic positions anyway. I mean, let's not worry about that. Let's cross that bridge when we get there. And so lo and behold, they appointed me director. And then we had to really cross the bridge because we had to figure out how to restructure the school, make it work without us. And it was really an adventure and a lesson in and of itself on how to make a business grow sustainably without depending on us being involved every step of the way. So that informed my teaching perspective when I built the program at UNT and I told musicians, listen, I can help you build a business, but we don't want to just build a business that is going to depend on you every single aspect. I want to help you build a business with the end in mind, whatever that end looks like. Maybe you want to grow it, partner with other people, delegate it, even sell it at some point, right? So that was kind of at the, at the core of my philosophy in coaching musicians that allowed them to build their businesses while still in school, because that's what I had done. I was a student, a doctoral candidate, and I built my school while still pursuing my studies. So that was a really interesting part of helping musicians just elevate their careers and figure out ways to 
even though they were busy, they thought this was the worst time of their lives to build a business, finishing a degree. I told them it's actually the best time of your life. You have access to connections, you have resources, you have mentors. This is the time for you to start a business. And so many of them were like, what? So I helped them do that. And then, you know, we got the program into national rankings, it was recognized as the, one of the top 50 music business schools by Billboard, Billboard Magazine for the entire five years I ran it. And I started reaching once again, that plateau of like, I feel like I can help even more musicians do this. Uh, and so I started exploring into the online space and, and seeing, you know, honestly, I had been reached out for, you know, many years by colleagues around me who had been coming to me already, simply because they associated me with my role at the university. And so I knew that people kind of came to me already, were drawn to me for this topic of helping them build their careers and build self-sustaining businesses. And so I started just branching out and having conversations with colleagues and other universities and, and friends of mine and just exploring if there was really a need for what I could do. And it really just three months into that process of exploration, the pandemic happened and everyone really needed now like a new game plan. People who had jobs, people who didn't have jobs, people who lost their jobs. And it really felt like, wow, this was an interesting timing because I realized now that what I'm about to do is really needed now more than ever. So everything just kind of really started growing from that point on. And after a year of doing both things, running the program at the university and running the business and coaching and building, you know, the, the, everything that I was doing, I decided that something needed to give, that it was just too much. I was really tired. I was burned out. I'm also a mother of two young boys. I almost three-year-old and almost eight-year-old at the time. Uh, and I just re re realized I had to let it go. I, I couldn't keep doing it. Uh, it was just too much. Uh, and even though I really had enjoyed the journey uh, of being a university educator and I was in a very you know, renowned position and tenure track and everything, I just decided I was going to quit. Much to the shock of many of my colleagues were like, what happened? And it wasn't that anything happened. I just felt that I, I had outgrown the position, frankly, and I wanted to give my new business my all. So now it's been almost a year that I've been back to being a full-time entrepreneur and, you know, helping musicians while at the same time learning about being an online entrepreneur as well and growing in that sense, which is very different than running a brick and mortar type business, which is what I had done before. So it's been a journey uh, of just learning and evolving throughout the years. So that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's very informative. So you saw my face when you mentioned the pandemic, and initially it was like, oh, what a terrible time. But of course, it was the perfect time. So that's really neat. Do you have, I, I've been curious about this since I started learning more about what you do. Do you have a particular type or a musician that your program caters best to? Or is there a niche like, just for example, is it does it lean more toward musicians that are somewhat similar to concert pianists or does it just cover the spectrum or are there a couple of areas where it really lends itself? Yeah, well, obviously as a pianist myself, I won't lie to you, many of my clients are pianists. You know, sure. since the beginning, most of my clients have, have come to me because they see that similarity and that, you know, we have a lot of things in common as pianists. However, um, I would say most of the musicians that, that have come into my program are musicians who are, established already in their industry they're they're established with their businesses they have a teaching studio whether it's an in-person or an online or perhaps they have a university position themselves but they want to branch out and do more and kind of see how they can serve at a greater level um, and they're just trying to optimize what they've been doing so that they don't have to be so burned out many of them are teaching for example in a way where they're undercharging and they're giving away all their time whether it's through depending only on performances, whether it's depending only on one-on-one -on -one students. And so I help them kind of take a step back and restructure their business models and optimize them into high ticket offers and build online high ticket programs, whether they're teaching programs or coaching programs that infuse their artistry in it. Meaning the things that they do for, for their creative outlet, whether it's performing or teaching or writing music or producing, we build those into their brand so that they can package that in addition to everything else they have to offer and, and coach others and teach others in an online delivery. You'd said something I have to repeat, so uh, I've never heard it before, but I've read it um, from people who just did it, not because I think they were told to, but you told your students this is the time to start a business, not, not when you're done. Um, 
I guess I want to ask is that do you get um did you get big reactions to that or has that maybe unique mentality of yours carried over into your business somehow? Yes, well, you know, it's interesting because when I um, started designing the curriculum because there was no program at UNT before I started. So I literally created everything from the ground up. I remember obviously coming from a background in entrepreneurship. I remember having the sense of like, these classes should be mandatory. <laughs> you know, what right. I'm teaching here, these things should be mandatory, yet they were not, right? The program I created was an elective program. It was something that students could opt into. Hmm. And I remember talking with, you know, my mentors and advisors and people around me they were telling me, you know what? It's actually good that it's not mandatory. And I was like, why? Because anything that people feel forced to learn, they're going to resist. And so instead, if you create the program and make it attractive so that students opt into it and want to follow this idea, want to follow this uh, entrepreneurial like movement, they're going to come in much more invested and they're going to show up and they're going to be more willing to do the work than if you impose it and make it mandatory. And that always stuck with me, you know, because... I realized that part of getting people to understand what we want cannot come from just forcing them or saying you have to do this, but instead is by modeling the benefits of what we think our philosophy can you know, offer and inviting people because of what they see that we do. Meaning I can't just tell them, you know, be entrepreneurial, grow, create your business, you know, continue practicing and having a way to integrate your artistry into your business and not do it myself. So that held me accountable as a role model for my students to have to keep practicing, to have to keep building my own business, to have to keep doing the things because they they were looking at what I did and that motivated them to do what I told them to do versus if I would have just shown up and said, oh, you should do this and you should build a business like this or you should, people would have been like, yes, but what are you doing, Right. You know, people will do what you do, not what you say. So that has been a really interesting part of this journey because it's helped me stay accountable, not just from the standpoint of building our own businesses or keeping our artistry alive, but also from a personal development standpoint, learning how to balance our life, taking care of ourselves, giving ourselves time for what is important and resting and, you know, doing all of these things. I feel like having a business has, has in a way, helped me stay accountable to myself and, and infused others to, to do that as well because of what they see, not just because of what I tell them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely understand the university's perspective on keeping it elective. And it sounds like it worked out beautifully. But to your point about like the way you felt like this should be required, I just spoke to a guy who is kind of in the early, somewhat early stages of starting his business. He is a uh, classical violinist. Uh, more than anything else. And he went to, um, goodness, my mind just drew a blank, the very famous music school on the East Coast, um, Berkeley College of Berkeley. Music. Yeah. yeah. And he w he got out, uh, finished, and their advice to him was to go take auditions as far as getting work. And you probably can guess that didn't work out. So he went to the business school for advice and things started that really helped him a lot. He audited, I don't know what, but he audited a course or two. And then some other things happened kind of like for you where he, certain resources presented themselves and then things were much better. Can you say something for me? I think I just lost my audio. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I still hear you fine. Just don't yes. hear myself, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, really? Oh yeah. It's all right. Okay. I can, I can, I have one ear free. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that is incredible and I, I would like to imagine or think that Berkeley has a, some sort of similar program but you and I both know and I, I don't have much formal music education at all but we hear the stories even if we don't have that education and, and it's not just in the discipline of music but it can be in many others where you get this great sort of technical tactical education that pertains specifically to your craft or profession but when it comes to dealing with the business world or possibly opening a business of your own kind of required, there was not much in that category. So very nice that you are part of making that happen or were part of making that happen at UNT. Yeah. And you know what? I have to say, it's all about developing that entrepreneurial spirit of looking for the opportunities because 
I know a lot of people that went, for example, through the education that I went through and did a doctorate, let's say, at the same university and got out really feeling cheated, right? That they didn't get the information that they needed, that they didn't get access to how to make money, how to build a business. Uh, and, and I think my entrepreneurial curiosity and also my willingness to listen to other people's advice helped me not get to that point where I finished the degree to then discover, now what do I do? I got pretty close, I'll be honest. I got pretty close to getting to that point. And I didn't really start thinking about all this almost in like the second year of my doctorate degree. It was a three-year program. So I almost got to the finish line and not getting any idea. I would have been one of those who's just like waiting to be picked. But thankfully, I had people around me who said, you know, you should, you should learn about the business. This, the program here actually has some really good business courses. And that motiv me, motivated me to say, okay, let me start taking an entrepreneurship course and learning. And, and that just took me into a whole new journey. I started working with people in the business program, the business school. I actually entered a, music, a, a business plan competition where all the other competitors were MBA candidates. And my husband and I were the only piano majors there. <laughs> and I just started kind of putting myself in these foreign environments. I had never gone out of the music school. And there were the, all these other schools, the school of business, the school of this, the school of that. So I really started just asking and seeking this advice. And I'm incredibly grateful for the education that I was able to get at UM because of like, I wouldn't have been able to open my school if I wouldn't have been at UM. So I also want to say that this is part of our own uh, desire to seek support. I know that most universities have resources, but musicians and creatives need to be willing to seek those out and not be waiting to be given things, right? So when I was at the university, of North Texas, even though it was a brand new program, my goal was to immediately establish partnerships with the business school. And by the time I left, we had already created our first MBA in music business because I knew that we couldn't just stay in the College of Music, even though it is the largest public music university in the country, about like 1600 music majors, there was a lot more to UNT than just the College of Music. So mm -hmm. I started branching out and creating relationships with other schools and building these partnerships and encouraging our music students to actually go there. And I'll tell you a funny story. So one of the first initiatives that I created was a music business competition, because that's how I had built my school when I was at UM. There was a business competition and I had participated. So I made one just for musicians. And, and uh, interestingly enough, the College of Business actually created their own business competition the same year. Um, and so our business competition, our music business competition, happened a few weeks earlier. And of course I helped all of our students build their business plans and we brought in all these judges. It was just a wonderful event. And I encouraged our students. I said, why don't you take these business plans to the College of Business and apply to their competition? I know, I know, I know. These are probably gonna be really elevated business plans. These are business folks, you guys are musicians, but trust me, I did that once when I was in your stage and I did pretty well. We ended up winning second prize, best business writ written business plan, best entrepreneurial spirit award. We won almost $10,000 and then opened our brick and mortar school a few months after. So I knew there was a potential. And so some of our students actually did. They applied to the business school with their music plans. And they ended up making from the 12 finalists, four of them were musicians. All of the judges in the competition, I mean, it was a university wide competition. Uh, four of us, you know, four of our music students ended up in the final round. And then one of them got the second prize, uh, just like I had, you know. And it was all this amazing, another one raised $5,000, even though she didn't win a prize, she raised $5,000 from two of the competition judges who helped her launch her business. I mean, it was just an incredible, incredible result just because they got out of their shell in the music school. So I think that was also a very important part of, of that process um, that you know allowed, allowed our students. And I think musicians can take advantage of that if they are in an academic setting is to go out of what they're doing and look for the opportunities because they are there. I think universities can be incredible hubs if you are willing to seek out the opportunities. It's a great story and, and good advice. So this is a question that came off your one sheet. I actually liked it. And, and I think it's safe to assume that some musicians will listen to this conversation and maybe sometimes listen to you and go, yeah, but I just want to make music and you're going to turn me into like some sort of business person. Or So that question of, you know, how do they create a business that might revolve around one of your specialties, scalable teaching or a coaching business while staying true to the artistic side of what they always endeavor to do? That is such a great question. And I personally went through that struggle myself. And I share this all the time. 
because obviously I had been a pianist all my life, all of my degrees are in piano performance and then life happened, right? I started my school, then I became a mom, then I started this university program. And for many years, my artistry, my playing kind of fell on the back burner. Even though I had some concerts here and there, I struggled to really sit at the piano and, and dedicate that time to my craft, even though it's my passion. And obviously it's what I do. It's part of my identity. You know, I wear this piano necklace, you know, you can see here yeah. since I'm like 17 years old. So many, many years, it's, it's like my thing. I didn't understand how I could just afford to sit down and practice and prepare these concerts and do all of this while running all of these other ventures. Right. And a few years ago, I just had this breakthrough and I said, the secret is in the umbrella. The secret is in the musician's profit umbrella, which is combining all of what we do and packaging our skills into an online brand and letting people see us for what we've done and everything we have to offer versus one side of ourselves. You know, I have so many conversations and I've been, you know, coaching musicians over the years, seeing that they have like five different websites and maybe use a fake name and things like that because they are so like partitioned into so many different things. So I said, actually, by putting it all together and building a brand and using my artistry as a way to help build a brand, that's the way to do it. Because then you have a way for people to work with you in some sort of a coaching or teaching fashion online. But then what you do as an artist feeds your brand, allows you to elevate your positioning and allows you to attract clients to what you do. So they're intertwined and no longer are they separate and no longer do you think, oh, well, I'll just do this business thing during the day so that I can really do what I love at night and practice. No, you actually think, well, now I have, you know, my team asks me, we want some posts of you playing the piano. We want some posts of you talking about this. They send me suggestions for content based on what they know is going to help reinforce my brand. So now I have a reason to sit down and practice. I just gave a concert in Charleston a few weeks ago in the International Piano Series. And it's awesome because I was able to bring in my audience through the process of rehearsing, getting the concert there, of course, performing the concert. But my, um, like my livelihood didn't depend only on that stage performance. I have a business that gives me that financial stability, but it also depends on what I do as an artist. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. I really like that. Okay, this one I have to admit I completely am completely stealing from uh, Tim Ferriss the Tim Ferriss show and uh, even the part where I say it, that it may not go anywhere, but I want to ask you if there's anything that you believe today about music entrepreneurship that you didn't believe maybe one or two years ago, or maybe just something that you've changed your opinion about in the last year or two. You know, one of the things that I've really become very, very passionate about in the last couple of years, especially is the fact that we need to be working as much as we can out of our zone of genius, meaning we should not be doing the things just because we can doesn't mean we should. In other words, we learn, we're quick learners, creatives, musicians, we, we can learn quickly. And it can be very tempting to want to go down this rabbit hole of doing a lot of the things in our business that we shouldn't be doing. And so I'm, 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 I like to learn and I find myself constantly having to remind myself of this principle is like, just because you can do things doesn't mean you should. You need to focus on being the CEO of your business, not being the one who executes everything. Uh, and I actually have clients who are, are past action takers, implementers, and are coming to me with all these Canva graphics and all these things that they're putting together. And I'm actually having to say, listen, these are great, but you're doing the wrong things. You're putting your attention on the wrong things. You need to be taking a step back and strategizing on the growth and the vision and the structure and how you're going to deliver and how you're going to grow your business and being the one who's like looking at the chess game and the director of the film, not the actor, not the one doing all the things. And for me, this has been something that I'm constantly having to remind myself uh, since the day one that I started my first business till today. It's a, it's a journey of always coming back to like, what are the things that I need to do and what should I look to take off my plate in any way that I can, right? Whether it's having people around me in my network, family, friends, whether it's hiring contractors, whether it's getting an employee on board, but it's just this muscle of like, not because I can do it means I should, I should always be very careful with my time and think carefully about what I should be doing so that I can work off of my zone of genius the majority of the time and not get caught up in things that are not what I should be doing. I love that. It's 
personal advice I can use today. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a journey, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So I know you have a really great website in terms of it's a great hub for everything that you have, all of your presence on social. I feel like you're on all the social networks, but we know there are many more that we don't necessarily need to make time for. But Fabiana Clauda, did I say it right? <laughs> yes, that's dot, just fine. FabianaClauda.com. And for those of you who need it spelled, you should look at the show notes for this episode to find <laughs> out how to, how to find that website. And uh, maybe some of you can guess. And also, I forgot to mention, but I heard a great interview with you which by the time this comes out will be a little dated, but um, from a podcast called Crushing Classical, and I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. I just kind of started listening to that today, and I think that people would enjoy that if they enjoyed this conversation. I really appreciate you spending time with me today. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation, and congratulations on everything you are doing as well. Thank I you. think the world needs more of us, you know, promoting entrepreneurship, helping musicians build their careers and build their businesses. And I'm just so excited that I get this opportunity to connect with you to learn about what you're doing as well. And I think, I think musicians can never have enough, you know, advocates for entrepreneurship and business development. So congratulations on this podcast and on your work as a coach as well. Thank you. And amen, sister. <laughs> this episode was powered by Podcast Startup. I've spoken with many podcasters about the struggles of starting a podcast, and they told me their main challenges revolved around fear, procrastination, and tech. I know what that feels like, yet I've recorded and published over 260 podcast episodes. I overcame these challenges and can help you do the same. Here's how I can help you. I've taken a look at all the things that worked, all the things that are still working, and all the things that didn't work, and I have put together a curriculum that will fast-track you to launching, marketing, and sustaining your podcast so that you can share your expertise, garner expertise from others, dig deep into a special interest, help others, get more website visitors, expand your personal brand, grow your network, or any number of other things you may want to do by starting a podcast. So you will be able to start, enjoy, and benefit from your very own podcast. To learn more, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup. Not only will you learn how podcast startup can help you bring your podcast to life, but you'll also get free actionable tips on starting a podcast right to your inbox. Again, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup to learn more. This episode was powered by Banzoogle, the platform for musicians and bands to build their website and manage direct-to-fan marketing and sales. Banzoogle features powerful design options, a commission-free store to sell music, merch, and tickets, detailed fan data, integrations with social networks, and more. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes a free custom domain name. Try it at Banzoogle.com and use the promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off your first year. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code Robonzo. If you love what I do, if you find value in what I do here on the podcast, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor or the show notes for this episode to learn about options for offering your support. The Unstarving Musician accepts direct financial support and we very much appreciate it, but there are several other ways to support the podcast and help keep it going. Again, you can learn more about those options for supporting the Unstarving Musician podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. Did you know you can help other Independent musicians find The Unstarving Musician by following or subscribing on your audio platform of choice? Well, now you do, and it really does help. And if you have feedback, please go to unstarvingmusician.com to get all my contact info. You can text me, call me, email me, leave a voice message right there on that page. Just go down to the bottom of the page and you'll find everything you need to know. I really would love to hear any of your comments, suggestions, questions, whatever you've got. And you can find links to just about everything talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. All right, I'm peacing out. <laughs> Thank you for listening and sharing with your musician friends and fellow indie music fans. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love. <laughs>